Welcome, bienvenue uh, to another weekly Hack Night uh, Neurotech X. Um, Neurotech X is an international community that facilitates the advancement of neurotechnology. Our pillars are community, education, and innovation. And we have chapters worldwide. Uh, you can find a chapter in your local community, perhaps a student club. And definitely, if you're not already, join our Slack. Um, and we have a newsletter and, uh, and some educational material as well. So just, um, just wanted to make sure we still have an intro. Um, although now I'm, now I'm in full screen mode. <laughs> Um, so, hi everyone, and um, yeah, I just wanted to, we were just uh, just talking about mobile EEG and the, the problems and issues, and this week was uh, Brain Products had the uh, Moby Awards, and uh, I'll try and find a link, but um, it, uh, they had a couple papers uh, a couple award winners and and the activities were pretty pretty aggressive you know um you know running and jumping and and um i forget i don't think it was actually cycling but it, something i sent to kyle because it seemed like something kyle would want to uh want to know about from his bike riding eeg and of course it had um i think the keynote was um was Scott McKeague, who has, has, or at least that was the first Moby Lab that I became familiar with, um, which is a huge, huge area um, in the basement of the San Diego Supercomputing Center. <laughs> and it's just this huge open room with, uh, um, you know, like green walls, like like Ryan, behind Ryan, and, uh, and four, four projectors, so you can project anything on the outside and then they give backpacks and you know they they were using 64 channel eg but like a biosemi in a backpack <laughs> and uh, um and that's and it was for for this very you know for that uh particular environment um that uh christian came in i, I think he was working on it before and maybe that's the other the Moby Lab that's in Germany, but anyway, Lab Streaming Layer was was kind of created for this uh, that particular problem, at least at least of multiple multimedia devices and and all sorts of uh, uh, wearables and you know EEG being one of them. Um, I, I know a guy, um, his name is Joe De Caesar, and he's working with some folks in Berlin, and he showed me. Some videos of this study that they'd done. It was like dance, um, yeah. and it's related to what they've been doing on Parkinson's. But it, uh, the yeah, they had this like big. It's kind of like a dance studio, um, but I think they had like um, uh, what kind of gear did they have? They they they, they had like cameras and, and movement tracking and had like loads of tech, and it, and it was like supposed to be like very very fine detail like body movement yeah. tracking and movement yeah. reconstruction and they were doing what that doing EEG at the same time. Omni track system um like uh, did they have tiny like little spherical dots on them um but could that would have uh, been I don't recall yeah I mean possibly um yeah but it 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 was it was like a serious piece of kit. I mean, just the room, you know. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, these these are people who like intend to be doing it. You know, like the the room is often like the most the most difficult part of your equipment, um, and those rooms are hardcore. Yeah. Um, sorry, I I found found Moby and. Uh, but it's somebody, somebody from like 30 years ago got in touch with me to, uh, that we, we used to study OCHEM together. And <laughs> first time I've heard from him. <laughs> um, there's some, some good stuff, uh, brain products that, uh, 
did with with eg artif mobile artifacts and and fnears because you know keeping keeping the um i mean it, at least in the the examples that they have the fibers um keeping those you know flush with the heads while you're moving is is also a big problem and and you know even uh um you know, it's not so much like actually falling away, but just movement where they, they, you know, roll. Slide. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, just, you know, any, any movement at all, um, and especially any, any gap. Um, and then, you know, your absorption is going to be, your, it's going to be uh, all confounded. The, uh, were those headsets that they used, were those tethered? Because, like, having a tether makes a big difference in just how people move. Um, like, in VR, there's been a number of studies about tether versus tetherless VR. And people fundamentally move differently when they know they have a tether. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but these, so, are, these are all wireless. Oh, okay, good. Yeah, um, yeah. I, you know, w wireless where you're you're carrying a good bit of kit on your back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, it's mobiaward.com. Um, so people can check that out, and. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you see a see one person with a bike, which I don't I, you know, I don't think that was Kyle, <laughs> but uh but it definitely could have been. Um so got kids and dog. Um other things this week. Um, you know, 3 days of Three days of hackathon for for human brain mapping, and um, I I want to get to that. Uh, but could we get an update, John, about um, the Open BCI uh, conversations? No major updates, I'm oh, afraid, okay. Morgan. Um, <laughs> although I, I would invite Jaden to comment if he has any particular comments to make. But um, if he doesn't, then we'll, we'll leave you hanging for the time being. Uh, not much other than we're on track with the, um, should be ready to have the integration for the EEG notebooks by tomorrow. So that yep. we can do, integrate into the master and give you everything that you need to set up the Muse LSL part with it. Um, but yeah, and then after that, I'll start getting working on the tutorial and we're good, good. to go. So yeah, it, we're on track. We have a timeline. I know we have like a plan anyway. For, it was roughly, roughly, well, we, do you want to hear the technical details? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, Jaden and I figured out a new um, class structure that yeah. is, that kind of incorporates some of the, the, the nice things that he came up with with Brainflow notebooks, but is device agnostic. Um, as in, so it just it just kind of some things that were in the code that were kind of specific to Muse LSL or that were specific to Brainflow. Um, kind of we've abstracted them so that the thing that they both do in common, we just have like a you know, methods that do that, and then a a Brainflow or a kind of um, Open BCI kind of instance or subclass would do something slightly differently to a Muse LSL subclass, but it would look the same at the at the API level. Um, so things like that, we, we kind of are on track with squaring those two things together. And then the other big job on the development side is um, is tidying up the documentation, which we will continue working on for the next few weeks. But the main plan is to finish those code modifications I just described and then, then get those to the team and get them kind of testing them for bugs and stuff while we're tidying up some of the documentation. So that's that's the agenda. Well, that, that sounds like a lot. 
I mean, like, I, I wouldn't say there's nothing to report. Uh, uh, well, there you go. I mean, and and so it sounds like you're also planning to actually merge this to the EEG notebooks. That's the, that that's the the plan we ended up taking, but the kind of intermediate route on that is we're going to do it via the brain for notebooks repo. So basically, okay, Jaden's just finishing up on some modif on the modifications that I just described, but he's not he's not put in the Muse LSL versions. So when he's finished with that. I'm going to go in and add in the Muse LSL versions, but that's all still in Brainflow Notebooks um, okay. repo. And w once that's working nicely, then we'll pull all of that over to the um, EG Notebooks master and or the, new, the EG Notebooks main repo, and then that's where it'll live. So that's that's a sequence. And if if for whatever reason, like we feel the need to just stick in Brainflow Notebooks, then we can do that. Sure, yeah, sure, currently sure. we're planning on pulling it over into the main repo. Um, well, that's great. I mean, you know, I I know I know it was a secondary goal, and you know that's that's cool. But uh, but it sounds like something actually you know came out of looking at both and considering a, a future where they're merged in terms of this this particular. And yeah, I mean, you know, it, it still needs to happen, and you know, hopefully, yeah. we won't be, you know, still talking about it in a year's time. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> well, yeah, that will um, be a record. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I would like to say that this is moving forward, and this is taking the whole project forward, and it's all been good, good developments that we, you know, had a nudge to get on with this stuff. So we'll have a we'll have a more device agnostic tool ready for people to use fairly soon. Yeah, yeah. No, that's that's great. Um, so, I mean, I, I I'm just looking in the in the Slack in terms of you know if there were any kind of questions that would be worth discussing with the group. I mean, um, I think everybody who's interested is is joined on Slack. Actually, I've got another, another kind of update, I guess. Sorry to interrupt, but um, oh, seeing yeah. as you were asking about the project, which is yeah. that we, and um, so we, we we did look into Open Humans as a kind of, you know, platform for the data management stuff. And particularly Richard looked into it in, in some detail. And um, I think made it's really worth looking into, really. Sorry? I, I have uh, well, looked did you I have looked into it, but I think it's. I think I'm. Key, I'm still looking at it, though. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. So, so we. So I think we we agreed that for this project we probably wouldn't go with that hmm. that approach because there was kind of a little bit more work to get that set up than we have time for. Um, but yeah, that that was also assessed um, in the last week or two. Okay. Well, I, I've been um, at least on the Open Humans front. Uh, I've uh, been joining their community call, which again is, is 10 a.m. San Francisco time. Um, adapt for your your local time zone, and um, I think it's it's a very interesting platform to you know be looking at your own data. Uh, um, for sure, you know, and it, it requires very little from us uh, to get started in terms of just uploading CSVs and and then being able to use, you know, a Jupyter notebook. Um, so, but, uh, you know, making making a study does, or, you know, if, if we want to be a study, it, it's not really about the Open Humans platform. Um, it's about all the stuff else that you'd need to do for it uh, in terms of, you know, uh, study study approval, study management, and, yes. and um, yeah. Quite. <laughs> yeah. Uh, now, you can, you can absolutely do an IRB approved study on Open Humans, and they don't. They, you know, they've got multiple. Um, there's so many, so many active projects on there, 
and of so many different sorts that you can find something that's that's pretty close. Um, I think, um, you know, and it, it ranges from, you know, very medical, very, very private in the sense of, you know, your genetic data, which could totally be, you know, used, you know, used against you potentially in terms of insurance or, you know, uh, workplace or things like that. Um, there's much more kind of like complicated data issues, if you will, um, with, yeah. with some of the, the current projects that they're hosting. Um, and I, I definitely reiterate the sentiment that I said last time or a while back is like, yeah. we'll definitely get to this at some sure. point. I know you, I know you're checking it out. Right. But like yeah. as a, as a group, um, yeah. yeah. And, and if anyone wants to just crack on and like learn more stuff and try things out, try out an API upload and figure some of the nuts and bolts out, then go ahead. But um, yeah, well, the, otherwise, otherwise we'll get there probably, you know, in a few months. Seems inevitable, doesn't it? Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> well, if if what I've what I've been doing at Paris and and you know here, um, anybody who's interested, in, you know, who's got a headset. Um, and, and at this point I'm, I'm just using the muse for myself. Um, now you, you received Jaden's, thank you, Jaden, for sharing your open BCI headset. Um, oh, it was just a 3d printed part. Oh, okay. <laughs> gotcha. Uh, um, so that's just the, the, the shell. Yeah. Open BCI is actually sending him the electro, the electronics okay. and boards. Okay. Well, thank you, OpenBCI. Um, uh, yeah, so for, for those who are interested, and um, so I got uh, a couple of people in France that uh, would be willing to upload their data. Um, if anybody else wants to, you know, um, we can do it. We can do it right now, <laughs> and and we can get the data. We can get the data there, and and then we just write the. I mean, and my idea is just to use use foof get, get resting data and just use foof to to look at it. Uh, so uh, last time I uh, I spoke, I remember I told you about I had some friends at a robotics lab here that mm. I can record a bunch of data from. Uh, one of my friends is actually on the call right now, Dylan Wallace. Um, so mm -hmm. if he wants to speak up at all, I don't know if you can hear it now. Um, so yeah, yeah. he can uh, we can reach out to everyone in the lab there and record a bunch of data that way as well, and sure. at least set sure. at the format that way. Sure. Yeah, I, I sorry, Dylan. I usually um, I forgot to say if anybody's uh, anybody's new here would like to just briefly introduce themselves. That would be great. Yeah, I'm uh, Dylan Wallace. I just graduated from uh, UNLV actually with a bachelor's in electrical engineering, and I'm an incoming PhD student to University of Michigan. I'll be working on cortical BMI with Chestic Lab. Uh, doing control of uh, some hand exoskeletons. Nice. So yeah, it's some exciting stuff. So I'm I'm just getting into the kind of like neurotech community, but it's very cool. Uh, yeah. That that sounds like uh, that sounds like exciting stuff. Um, yeah. If if you've got any you know if you've got any lab links or or um, things that they've worked on that you can post, that would that would be cool too. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Thanks. Um, just anybody, anybody else who'd be um, interested just to introduce yourself. So we we love to have new people here, and always love questions. Um, yeah. So if you've got a Muse or or OpenBCI, and you are interested, um, please you know. You can you can join us on the community call uh, on Tuesday and um, and on Thursday there during the day um, they do a quantified self. I mean you can talk about the issues you've got with uploading your own data and visualizing it and um, and yeah 
So not to uh, well, that doesn't have to be on the agenda today, but they they've they do have um, like I was saying, like there's um, it's a great way to get access. I mean, you know, there's an open humans app that you can install on your iPhone and then you can get access to your Apple Watch data. And, you know, there's, as in setting up a project, you have, you know, this, this great list of, of already accessible devices and, and uh, ge genetics kits. Um, and, you know, obviously like Fitbits and uh, Google Fit and, uh, and there's a second app. So it's the Open Humans, um, Open Humans Health Kit app. Um, it, you can install to get your Apple Watch data. And the Overland um, connection gives you access to all your GPS data, which is another um, more than just you know your steps. You can get you know distance run or things like that. Um, yeah, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty good, uh, for, for all those other devices. And I've been, I've been checking the watch against, uh, against a, uh, little, little cheap, uh, automated, um, blood pressure, blood, uh, heart, heart monitor, <laughs> uh, seeing, seeing how, seeing how accurate this is. Um, all right. So no no decision on what the what the project uh, project name is. Not yet. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um in my best suggestions, of course, anonymously. <laughs> okay. Well, let me let me know when there's there's things that we can we can uh, open up to the the greater group. Um, all yeah, right. How do you feel about having just maybe this group vote on it too, and consider that next week, or since it's kind of a little late now. I, I I like it. You okay with that? I'm a, he's the Mr. Project Manager, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, definitely. Uh, it, we'll we'll see what John says. Yeah, I'm fine with that. Yeah. <laughs> um, as I mean, as long as everyone votes for the one that I prefer, <laughs> then that's fine. Yes, yes. All right. Let me. So, any other? news or announcements this week uh canadian computation neuroscience symposium okay. successfully the inaugural yeah, yeah. canadian and computation neuroscience symposium successfully executed on monday yeah. and tuesday available on crowdcast i'll, find, I'll, I'll post the link uh, crowdcast is awesome yeah for running events like it, it took a bit of figuring out, out how we were gonna you have like green rooms and you have to kind of accommodate speakers and stuff but yeah um it really kind of pulls things together and gives makes them present really nicely um so there's two days of workshop for people who are interested in computational neuroscience and um it's not just canada i mean there's keynotes from like we've got a keynote from nancy copel that was a big deal that's awesome um, uh, yeah, I'll post the link, but that was the first one and maybe it'll be the first of many, hopefully be the first of many. Yeah, Unfortunately, I, mean, I, I had to miss the uh, HBM brain hack. Um, yeah, because yeah, yeah. We had a conflict that I hadn't realized when we were scheduling it. Well, I mean, I, I assume this, this was scheduled a long time ago, right? Uh, well, no, the oh. other interesting thing about this conference is we came up with it in about a month and a half. 
Okay. <laughs> I mean, the full history is like there was an event that was planned. There was like a physical workshop that had a funding and stuff, and that couldn't go ahead. And it, which it kind of worked out well, but the people who were organizing it, they didn't want to kind of make that thing online. So we rapidly came up with just a completely different identity for the for an event and um, just came up with a completely new event with about two months notice. And uh, it's, yeah, it's a testament to what, like, what you can achieve in two months with a one person driving uh, the team, which wasn't me. Uh, hats off, Scott Rich, who was the driving force behind the event. Um, but yeah, there were four people on the organizing committee. And we, in the end, we had like 450, 500 people registered and about 200 people, 150, 200 people there on both days. That's amazing. So from just about every continent, because there was one person tuning in from Melbourne. So we had everywhere, all continents covered. Um, so yeah, we're, we're quite happy how that went. I'll post the link right now. And yeah, you can, because yeah. it's Crowdcast, you can see the videos right. and there's lots of cool talks there. Yeah. And that's that's what Neuromatch is using too. Yeah, that's where we got the idea from. Yeah, it was okay. a Neuromatch like blog post on how to do a crowdcast event. We just yeah. rinsed their idea, and yeah. it worked perfectly. No, 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 that's cool. I, I, I don't. I haven't really followed the the kerfuffle about um, uh, OHBM. You know how they're how they're managing it and what they're what they're using but it i take it it's not going to be crowdcast <laughs> no well yeah we'll see you next week yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Um, excited to find out <laughs> okay uh gotcha um so yeah, I didn't um, didn't actually have anything planned for for today, um, except to maybe go into you know some of the some of the particular projects that um, that we're working on. If people have questions, or you know, if you've got topics that um, that you'd like some feedback on. Um, I'd I'd love to hear. <laughs> Question first: Did any, anyone here um, do the HPM brain hack? Sort of. I oh, did. Yeah, but I, I I was I'm I was kind of focused on the imaging. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, I was just curious how it went, you know, any, anything to report? I, I mean, you know, some, lots of great projects and they were running, they were running talks, um, you know, and, and they were covering multiple time zones. So you could really, you could catch if you were up early, you could catch, you know, things in Europe and catch the Americas and, and et cetera. Um, um, so I did not did not check out uh, Leipzig's um, EG processing, or you know, um, but uh, I was I was particularly taken with Connecto Mapper three, and they were opening that up to to try and use that for EG, and we had to actually that was the that was kind of like the original pipeline. Um, yeah, Connecto Mapper's back. So Connecto <laughs> Mapper is back, right? It's so uh, I remember like, CMP. I remember it, it it had a kind of glorious introduction yeah. and then it really just tanked. Yeah, on well, the, uh, yeah. Maintain, maintenance point of view. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, so they stopped maintaining it like, I don't know, 2015 or something. Um and uh I, I, did it ever actually go to 1.0? It was it was like always beta. Um, I know, yeah, I know. Everybody worked that thing. <laughs> yeah. I 
and um the pipeline yeah you know yeah, so um, it, and it it had some night pipe um customizations you know um that was a 2.0 right they moved it to night pipe yeah yeah mm. and and um anyway it, it it they wanted to make it about eeg and um so that that was what we were using it for, even though we were using you know diffusion data, obviously, to to you know to, we were using the parcelation parcelations and the diffusion data to get connectivity, but but we were only interested in in looking at EEG, you know, and that was that was their um, advertised projects. Um, and then um, Farshid, uh, a guy at USC, was was running um, a Nifty Torch uh, uh, project. So that's that's um, great group, microstructural imaging group at USC, and yeah, ni nice nice um, integration of you know Nye Babel and PyTorch and and uh but for kind of adney structural like imaging or you know structural like analysis um so yeah i think very relevant to the the kaggle the trans kaggle competition um for you know those interested in doing things like that um but the connecto mapper, I think, you know, especially of interest to people doing high density EEG and MEG. Um, Are they doing something special on that front then with the EEG connectivity? Well, I mean, just better better integration with M and E. I I don't think there's. I mean, I I don't know what would be the. Yeah, I mean, I would love to know what people were looking for, um, but uh, I, I would just like a supported pipeline for <laughs> to get you know to get like uh, say you know five hundred you know go back to the the old days where you know it could produce five hundred parcels you know equal size parcels per hemisphere, and then give you you know some sense of the connectivity on the basis of you know resting fMRI and diffusion yeah that that was that was the only thing i really i always i never stopped using that actually i still use it still use the uh, sand parcelation thing from the yeah TNT, TNT library yeah there are other kind of better high resolution parcelations now there's like these schaefer 1000 ones from thomas yo's group that Sure, it seems to be kind of produced more consistently, and they're from a kind of um, I don't know. They've done more work in kind of demonstrating that they're robust it, um, clustering on fMRI data, right? Yeah, yeah. The original sand parcelation was just kind of free surface subdividing. That's right. But That's you know, right. high resolution, right? I mean, you want you want we want lots of nodes. You want more than sixty brain regions. Yeah, yeah. Your brain into sixty brain regions is just nuts. I can't believe we still do it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, those those original Hagman papers were great in terms of showing that, like, you probably didn't need, you know, a thousand parcels. <laughs> uh, but it's good for it, the figures. Though. <laughs> but it, it was it was yeah, it made pretty pictures. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, but but having the process right like and definitely the process could be improved but you know how you definitely want to start with the i mean i still think it's it so um a really great paper sorry this is i know this is imaging and i feel i feel bad talking about imaging. um but great great paper from the uh from the synonyms group um so bioarchive paper showing, and um, they're doing robust robust segmentation of sixteen tissue types in the head, including the neck. And 
you know, the, all this stuff is, is, you know, really of interest if you're, is only of interest if you're doing finite element modeling, which, you know, is, is pretty rare. Um, but um, uh, some great stuff. Hey, Alex. And um, yeah, I, I do want to, I want to get a link to that paper just because um, for, for open EIT, um, this is this is a really this is a really awesome paper from um, from Axel's group, um, but I'll try and <laughs> try and move move back to to Neurotech. Uh, <laughs> this is this is like imaging tech or algorithm tech. We we were having this debate. Um, semi-debate or whatever discussion in the um, EDU working group about like the definition of neurotechnology. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, for, the, for, the for the purpose of um, this curriculum that we're writing um, and just in terms of focus, but try and, because you can have like a broad definition and a narrow definition and there's various definitions, but like a broad definition would be you know every technology that's used in neuroscience and that's that's too broad a definition so we yeah. came down with like things that are either that fit what i one or both of two criteria one is um somewhat human oriented um and the other is somewhat consumer electronics oriented and those those two things kind of more or less cover most of the things that we wanted to include, but rule out certain things like, you know, voltage sensitive dye imaging or, you know, invasive EFIS that's not a, uh, you know, implanted for surgical reasons, right? Things like that. Fast. But it's kind of back and forth, like, it's hard. You, you make a definition and you kind of exclude a bunch of stuff, like, but I want to include these things. But then you realize that you just made, you just defined everything in the world into your definition. I know that's too much. I think I think it's a hard definition. Um, yeah, or certainly I, I I have a hard time figuring out what our what our particular bounds in this particular you know in this discussion group should be. Uh, I feel like maybe sixteen class tissue segmentation and MRI <laughs> is, is outside outside the scope uh -huh. of the group but uh, uh our, our definition did in the end i mean it does in the end kind of include imaging though because i said like it's going to be somewhat human oriented and somewhat consumer tech oriented and um F mri is not consumer ele electronics but it is human oriented so so it fits but it wasn't it's not our top priority on the curriculum it's kind of middle way down Yeah, it's it's certainly it's hard to ignore, right? Um, and at least in the in the Connecto Mapper, uh, the nice thing is that you can make it use you know you can make that uh, that imaging data useful in your your EEG. <laughs> um, there's there's actually a couple couple new papers from Axel's group. Um, that I'm just going to post here. Oh, yeah, you know what? This wasn't on them. This was actually... So that's that's a bioarchive paper of, of a recent Simnibs... Uh, study, but um, this was actually published. Um, and yes, here it is. So Ula Ula Pionti, 
Um, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that right correctly, but um, but great pay. And you know, and this is this is really hard stuff, right? Like if you want to do if you want to do whole head EM modeling, um, you need more than three tissue class, <laughs> right? Uh, and um, some of that, uh, well, yeah. So for those interested, please check it out. Um, or they say 15, sorry, why did I get 16? But, um, but a nice, nice validation against other, other tools. And I, we, we only had, we were previously using, um, SPMs, um, SPMs kind of like priors and then trying to get six tissue classes. Um, so this could be this could be really cool, um, but that was that was my paper. I got excited, by. <laughs> but there was a bunch of good papers. But this was this was really useful for for um, people who want to do EIT. Uh, let me check what else I've got saved. Um, I want so again, just checking in, see if anybody's any, anybody new has joined us and would like to introduce themselves. Now, um, no pressure. Um, I just want to give uh, Abby a shout out and say thank you for setting up the diversity channel on Slack, getting that started, and um, and reaching out in the reaching out in the community. Um, really, really glad that uh, you're you're keeping keeping conversation going. That we. Um, that we started last week, and um, yeah, I thought I th certainly thought that. Uh, glad to see that Blake Blake Richards is too. <laughs> the, um, so my pleasure. Anyone go join that? Um, it's just an open channel. It's called Diversity. Yeah, yeah. So. Did you post that in, in general? Yeah, yeah, I posted that in the general Neurotech X work group, um, but then it's own channel with no search, or you can do it in the general post. Yeah, I mean, I, I still I still think it's, you know, it's a particularly, like, it's a different issue for an open community in terms of how we do it. it you know, versus versus like say what Blake or you know what somebody had posted in the diversity channel about uh, a, a Twitter thread that of interest. Um, so I think I think we will have to come up with something um, that is adapted to our our open community, um, but it will definitely have to be an active thing. So really glad, really glad you got that started. And um, yeah. So um, just one sec. I'm just. 
It's getting a shower started here for someone. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes, hello. Hey, I am Alex. I was here last time. And um, I just joined the Slack, and I'm still kind of new to which channels to do what. But I, I, I found the uh, diversity channel that you guys mentioned. And Abigail, I posted there saying that I want to continue to try to figure out which materials we have that are educational for beginners and project sort of guidance for more like ambitious hack. Uh, hackathons and or um, uh, boot camps where people are trying to like build an app project. Sometimes they do like five app projects over the course of their boot camp, and that could be a neurotech uh, option amongst them. So in the diversity direction, the reason this is relevant is um, that there are specific groups like incubators that have a huge audience of uh, more diverse groups. So there's, there's like a guild, I think it's called the guild, in Oakland, which is like a scholarship-based uh, boot camp thing. And I know that there are ones that specifically um, facilitate women uh, and other groups. So that's like a way to put something in their hands that makes Neurotech feasible and gives them a channel to mentors. If they need mentors for such a boot camp or thing, if they're like, hey, yeah, we, we'd love to have someone do that project, but we need someone available to help them with it then they could reach out to you or other folks in Neurotech X. Yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah. And um, I don't want to like hijack at all, but just get the um, juices flowing a little bit. One of the places that we were thinking about starting is um, just creating a basic set of resources and having like a question hour. And just uh, if we can get a, almost an email list from a couple of NGOs um, and fire out like, six hours of resources a week and just have an open questions uh, area so that if someone is kind of curious and it starts out really easy, but it kind of gets a little more intense and just have like a few weeks where people can come and ask questions if they're confused about a tutorial or a workshop that we already have on hand. Uh, that would kind of be a fairly easy way and probably a really useful way of getting people that are already a little curious but don't know where to start uh, hitting the ground running. So teach the teachers, like kind of like the theme we talked about before. Yeah, exactly. But um, yeah, kind of like sending it out though to uh, almost university age students or even just people in their 20s. Okay, either... so students too. Students and teachers. Anyone who wants help with educational materials of any kind. Yeah, That's exactly. Really cool. but it wouldn't be aimed at students or teachers necessarily. It would be, uh, for example, going through an organization like Black Girls Code or going through an organization like that. And it would just be asking them to send it out to their entire list. Something like we would start with something really easy, like the Wait by Why article. That's just kind of exemplifying through a link and how he just kind of hypes it up and doesn't really get technical at all, but yeah. just gives a nice broad overview. We'd start with something like that and then have a question hour um, and have people that can kind of talk to different applications of the field at the question hour. So cool. something along those lines is kind of what I was thinking. Also, Morgan, I can reach out to you about this, but we could also potentially have like a question hour um, merge into this call if you were looking for things from your gender and or anything along that line. Cool. Well, I'm, I am a noob kind of to neuro stuff myself, so I think I, I, I'm a, a decent facsimile of the average like beginner at this, right? I have programming background, but I'm kind of new to the neuro side. So um, let me I have that. an open question while everybody's on the line. So Morgan just shared in the diversity channel the uh, learn.neurotech.edu, and it has like lessons under that. What what is that, what age group is that geared to? Like uh, a strong high school student, any high school student, uh, middle school, just college? What are these lessons like geared, to what grade level? It's a minimum strong high school student. Mm -hmm. Well, part of diversity is we gotta make everything easier for everybody. That's one of the things I try to do uh, at OpenBCI. So uh, it's 
but I, th I guess that's about as far as we reached down so far. It was like a strong middle school to uh, high school student. Because uh, what are some things that people need to know before they would I definitely buy these lessons? Do they need like biology one? It's a pretty good introduction on most of the fronts. Um, I'm more just that strong high school student because this topic itself is kind of confusing and complex. And so it could be someone younger, but they would have to keep up with understanding the introduction to all these different things. But it so it's a very it's a very widespread overview of basics throughout this entire field. Um, so theoretically, like someone younger could hop into it, but I just think that it would be uh, challenging in general. But I think that this resource itself is definitely one that I like to distribute to new people getting into the field. Maybe kids younger than this, they should just experience it and see the brainwaves, and that maybe that's enough. Like, what would we, uh, what could we do to help instruct, you know, fourth graders using what Neurotech has? I had a thought about that, which is that there's kind of like the most minimal format, which is called Hour of Code. And the Hour of Code initiative has hours of code from many different tech stacks. So there's an Hour of Code with JSON. There's an Hour of Code with Unity. And every one of these different technology kind of platforms or frameworks has put forward like what you could learn about their approach to coding in an hour. Um, and so if we can uh, use one of the notebooks, for example, which runs in a browser, the notebooks sound like you can make an hour of code notebook. So um, if it doesn't rely on any sensors that the person doesn't have, but instead has captured data from a previous use of sensors, or if it can use the webcam to do face tracking or something else that's not hardware dependent, then a notebook that someone can open could be listed on the Hour of Code website. And that's something that kids literally are looking at, like, oh, I want to learn programming. Well, how should I start? And teachers that are looking to introduce programming in young uh, school age classes pull from there without even having necessarily known who we are if we're listed there. Yeah, we could do that. That sounds like straightforward with the stuff that we already have. Um, what's the what's the process then? Do we like get in touch with uh, people? Do you check out the site and push it? Go for you? Uh, that's exactly what I'm trying to figure out right now. I've never submitted anything to it, but I'm going to look up how do we get something on our code. And cool. um, I haven't tried any of our notebooks yet, um, but if someone has a suggestion for which of the EDU uh, notebooks might be the best for a starter one, um, I can try to start helping wrangle one into hour of code format. Uh, yeah, yeah. if you look up the process and then we can talk about the content and maybe we'll kind of add in more explanatory content, which we need to do anyway. So that's, yeah. you know, still kind of, that would be kind of killing two birds with one stone anyway. As a noob, this is the only aspect of the educational stuff that I am qualified to help with. <laughs> awesome, yeah, just let me know what you find. Cool. So I guess y'all are talking about uh, to make Neurotech EDU resources even more accessible is do a hundred hours of code thing. Oh, it's called hour of code. Oh, just one. It's not like a one hour. Hours. Yeah. So everything hours of code it should be sort of self-contained. And the notebooks are in the, the epitome of self-contained tech wise. So if we had like a, a, a data set or two and maybe something only using webcam or, or voice or something else that's just using, you know, what a the typical laptop has on it, then that could fit in a one hour format, hopefully. So what would the kids do in an hour? Well, I haven't looked at all the notebooks, but um, I would like, imagine. Uh, visualize some data? Yeah, I would imagine that there's some data. So let's say we say, OK, we had you know, we had 50 people try this out and wear the sensors while they did some experience. And then we're going to try to analyze that and see what we can discover or something like that. I don't know. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, that's real science. <laughs> and it's uh, packaging it nice and neat for the kids is a good thing to do. I think that the, the Muse possible. headband, I mean, I just got this Muse 2 after hearing people's recommendations last week. I think that the Muse 2's like product focus is around mindfulness and uh, the uh, multiple sensor modalities that it has include heartbeat and stuff. So if we did a first one and it was something about, let's say like, breathing and like well-being type indicators, 
that's really relevant to school age kids because they're encountering new stresses all the time. And they've written been education to, they've been kind of ties to in. Get the kids to meditate anyways in many schools across multiple yeah. countries. They just, I, I've seen reports from all over the, uh, so yeah. yeah. They are trying to meditate and helping the kids quantify that a little bit. It would help. But yeah. then you get like backlash from using it in an education setting if you really want to. But these are things like if the parents are aware of it and they hear about it at school, you know, if they've got the money to do it, they should be able to do it. Or they can, sh you know, bring one, a couple parents get it and then they bring it to class. That would be the best thing ever. If you could get five headsets, that's enough for one class. And then you could just share. Yeah, the other nice thing about the Muse is that... um it once you start using it regularly and you start practicing feedback um even if you just start out with it meditating after you lose the muse you are naturally way better at it because you've kind of figured out the learning curve and gotten over the initial difficulties so even if these kids are only able to use the muse a couple times uh in class settings if they had to meditate afterwards without the muse uh they'd be significantly better at it and significantly more calm like more quick, quicker to get into their calm states, uh, even without using the news. And of course, we'd love to get uh, some good focus algorithms at OpenBCI. That's on the docket to do. <laughs> Just open source it. <laughs> yeah, there are a few repositories knocking around that have some of those yeah like focus algorithms built in i think i need you notebooks for that but that's not what it's kind of focus is although it could easily support that um but there are, yeah i i've seen people i think on this call or, or definitely like in the, in these discussions i've seen github repos with code in for alpha over beta ratios but like you know indicators like that um and those would be useful if you wanted to have a um a meditation oriented data session but there's nothing there's nothing in eg notebooks for that but there certainly could be if people wanted to put it together is there any open source eeg based uh depression tracking <laughs> That would, be, that would give you give you uh, um, some sort of metric on your EEG. I'd be willing to start working on one. Like, doesn't need to be shared with anybody. You have a login. You look at your stuff. It helps you. That's it. Yeah, just the uh, biofeedback tracking, and because that's uh like going through TMS one right now. That's something that um. I kind of wish that they did through the sub through the sessions was taking like regular neuro data and they don't, which I think is kind of weird. It's based all off of uh, self reporting, whereas I know other other areas do. So uh, I think it'd be really cool to develop some type of open source, and I would happy to be some type of guinea pig for it as well. Well, I think for consumer devices is the liability of it because if a if a consumer uh, device is able to might be diagnosing that crosses the uh, medical mount uh, practicing without a license thing. <laughs> Moving into but FDA is, territory. But, not if we don't make any claims. But but Jaden, I mean, I, I think your your point is is um, I mean, going through TMS is something that like longitudinal EEG, even if you don't know what it means, you know would be uh would be great to have you know and um i mean the, the only thing that i i would bring up is of course um is alto neuroscience which is um you know this this stanford spinoff that had the paper i want to say it was january february but um you know where it was like they're using they're using eg um and and their in-house algorithms to um, to predict your treatment response to a particular particular antidepressant, 
Yeah, I've read about that. It's very interesting. And I was thinking about like uh, back when I was doing the antidepressant route, I was thinking about kind of uh, trying to replicate that with OpenBCI type hardware, but now I'm going down the TMS route. So, 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 I mean, it's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting paper. Right. And, and one of the early meetups I posted, um, uh, you know, I posted the, the, a link to the paper plus a, um, a link to a Twitter discussion uh, about some of the, you know, the, a discussion about some of the stats used and, and how uh, appropriate they were. Do you, do you remember this, John? Yeah. Yeah, the takedown tweet, the, tw the yeah. takedown thread. Yeah, well, it, it it went back and forth, and then like somebody else replied to that first person, and they were like, "Not from the paper," and then they were like, "No, no, no, you, you can do this." <laughs> this is on my to-do list to do a deep dive on actually this um this whole study and yeah. the Embark study is on the NIMH data archive. Um, so. If you ask them nicely and you convince them that you're worthy, then you can access the data um, to your to your question, Abby. Um, so, and, and also to your question, like, no, there aren't there aren't that many, or e indeed any, like really open EEG and depression um, data sets, like there are for say neuroimaging and Alzheimer's, um, and. That's something that hopefully will change soon. But that what there are is there are a few like largest studies, largest clinical trials that are kind of. Uh, I mean, the Embark one you could say is a semi-open in that you can request access, and you probably, you know, as long as you. I don't. Maybe maybe you need to be affiliated with an institution. I'm not exactly sure what their policy is, but um, you can certainly request access. Um, and it's the it's the NIH or the NIMH data archive, so they're presumably supposed to, you know, provide the data to people who uh, have a legitimate reason for for looking at it. Um, and then, yeah, there are other studies where you know you can contact and potentially persuade to get access to the data, but it's a bit de behind really this area compared to other clinical domains. Um, and hopefully that'll change soon. So, so my the other thing I have here. <laughs> um, so this is the Modma data set, um, and this is just the end licer end end user license agreement. Um, the there's a group in China that made a depression data set available. Um, it is, uh, it's a, um, so I, I also posted, well, I, I think I posted this in Slack and it's probably disappeared at this point because of our message limit. Um, um, so I'm happy to, to repost this. Um, I've, I've filled out their agreement. So th th what's interesting about this particular data set is that, um, it's a high density data set. So it's 128 channel. It's, it's, they happen to be using an EGI um, system. Um, yeah, yeah, but, you know, it, uh, at I least bet that gave you tickles inside when you saw that. I, I, I at least know how to import the data. Um, but um, it's particularly interesting. So I, I'm trying to get in touch with this, this group in China that, um, They've got that data set and a three channel low cost uh, system that they also used, right? And so I forget the, um, let, me, um, let me find their, their particular name, but like their, their research lab name is like the open source, um, uh, it's like, uh, Yeah, it's here. So here's the here's the archive link, and um, yeah, 
Now, I, you know, this is not sufficient numbers, uh, um, but uh, I just wanted to get the the lab name. Yeah, it's the Open Source Software and Real Time System Group of the Ministry of Education, <laughs> and they've got this three chan three electrodes, you know, wearable three electrode EEG collector um, is what they how they describe it, but. Um, it's not it's not Abby what I would call you know a I mean even even the Stanford study is only like um, I think it's like 300 three three four hundred subjects you know the Child Mind Institute already has like thousands uh, uh, you know uh, not that that's focused on depression but um, but what you really want is is, is the, like that that normative sample. And to be doing, you know, what they used to call in the '70s QEEG off of that. I mean, it doesn't have to be frequency domain, but but where you're, you know, you're looking at your your EEG with respect to that to a, a really sizable population data set, right? Um, anyway, just just wanted to, you know, <laughs> have to have that. No, that's <laughs> useful. Thanks. Appreciate that. Didn't yeah. So I've I've filled it out and um, um, yeah I might need to talk to somebody about um, getting an a an official uh, um, some sort of of institution to you know they they haven't replied yet. <laughs> um, well, we can look at this together if you like. Yeah. There's, there's definitely, I mean, so what I love about it is that they've got the two measures. I mean, they got the two systems, right, from the same subjects. And, you know, it, it's still, you know, I mean, I, I even with 55, I want to call it a handful of subjects. But, but it does get to the point of what can you do with a three-channel low-cost system that, you know, because in this particular case with depression, right, they're they're mostly people are doing some sort of nonlinear time series analysis, and you could honestly get that from a three channel system, uh, uh, you know, with uh, with some caveats. But uh, it says under stimulation as well, but doesn't say what. I mean, is it TMS? Um, uh, I was actually only, I only request, I requested the resting data. Um, uh, I think it's some sort of. Uh, is it an auditory? Inter yeah. Interviewing, reading and picture description. Okay. It's, it seemed, um, yeah. I have a general question about whenever you're requesting special data like this from a study. Are you supposed to delete it after a year? Like, uh, what what if somebody keeps it and then tries to, you know, look at something else other than what the study was intended? Because this was for, you know, mental disorders. But then there are, they start looking at something else for it because they hung on to it. Is that allowed? It, it depends on what they make you sign. Yeah. So... So the Child Mind Institute data, for instance, the EEG data is under Creative Commons license, right? And you know, other than like not for commercial use, you can you can really do what you want with that data. In this particular case, I, I'm signing a, a, a EULA that is pretty specific, and and I also you know had to give you know background of the proposed research project that I would be using it for, you know, description of the methods to be used. Um, and, you know, even down to, um, yeah, that I'm not creating any military applications, <laughs> which I was like, no. I was like what? Um, uh, but that sounds like quite the barrier to using this data, even though it's under Creative Commons already. No, 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 no. 
No, oh. no, no. These are two different data sets. Oh. I'm, I'm, oh, okay. I'm talking about the range, right? Uh -oh. So, so the child, I'm always yes. telling people how awesome the Child Mind Institute did is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this, this is very different in the sense that, oh. like, it, it, you know, part of, part of like why they want you to be at an institution and have, you know. Uh, uh, people supervising data management is is kind of to your to your point, Richard. Like, like, what's the project? What's the you know how's the data going to be used? And like, and I, was, I don't want PCI does this thing. I don't want that data being misused later. But uh, I guess if we make it Creative Commons, is what about uh, the Open Team and stuff? Is that all Creative Commons? No, it depends on the project, right? So, sorry, say again. At oh. Open Humans, I think it depends on the project and you specify. Yeah, so so Open Humans, like you have access to your data. Yes. That's 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 like that's it. If you if you're if you want, you can make your data available to a study. Right? And and then the IRB, you know, would have received, or you know, the 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 project uh, um, would have said what was going to be done with that data, and and you know, if copies were going to be made, and you know, things like that. But um, uh, yeah, they 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 can definitely accommodate a wide range of of possibilities. Um, and you you don't have to make your data publicly available, or at least you know it can be on the site and not publicly available. For sure. And and I think these are these are perfect examples of of you know essentially or you know TMS and 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 other. Um, I mean the. Um, I'm trying to remember the I forget the PI's name at Stanford on this, but um, uh, oh, I learned about PIs today. <laughs> it's a big deal. <laughs> but uh, uh, I mean, these these are these are you know these would be really interesting interventions to see to see pre and post EEG. Um, uh, yeah, I don't even know anybody that's undergone. Y'all are talking about transcranial magnet. Yeah, we're. I, so, I've never. Nobody I've known here in Louisiana has ever done that. Oh, I. I mean, I. But I bet you that there are TMS uh, centers available. You know, like that that you can you can use. Um, uh, the the paper that I that I posted from the um, uh, from the Simnibs group. Um, they do a lot of the uh, electromagnetic modeling of these, you know, of TES and TMS. Um, uh, sorry, well, so I think it's, there's, you know, TMS EEG is also a thing, right? Like you can basically, you know, you can you can d learn something about a person's brain structure and um, connectivity by recording EEG after you know during a TMS stimulation um, uh, is is some other really interesting stuff to the to the point that we were you know I've been actually looking on eBay <laughs> in terms of getting uh, um, you know trying to find a cheap cheap TMS system. Um, so if, if anybody has uh, has a line on cheap TMS, I, I've not wanted to, you know, it's hard to get people to agree to use your your homegrown uh, electrical stimulation device. <laughs> um, and although, you know, we've done it before. Uh, um, so I, I thought that if it was, you know, a medical grade TMS system, but just, you know, use, 
uh, that that people would be a little little happier about it. Um, yeah, but some some great stuff also from Stanford the the Saint study uh, showing the um, uh, what do they call it um, uh, thalamic um, no th theta burst theta burst uh, stimulation so a, p a particular kind of TMS protocol is showing itself to be as as effective if not more than ECT I'm uh, undergoing theta burst actually yeah yeah, yeah. A and and that's that's really exciting just because you know it, it, the psychiatrists that I talk to always talk about ECT as being you know the real like the real thing that works and um so yeah but I, I mean what I would love to to see if we could get a you know a low cost um I mean no I don't want to say a low cost if we could get a used <laughs> a used system that we can afford um, to to look at what's that actually doing differently than than previous TMS you know protocols that have been used in depression. Um, can you remind me what ECT is? Uh, electroconvulsive therapy. Ah, so that, yeah. that, that 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 so and <laughs> covered in in neuromodulation. This year, a conference, great, great conference. You know, th this is inducing a seizure, right? Yeah. So, so still, still used. You know, um, uh, mostly still used for um, treatment resistant depression, but, but still, lots of psychiatrists who, who you know swear by it in terms of like it is the. Um, you know, because of the, I don't want to say harm because it's, it's, you know, it's much different than, than what you saw in the, you is know, it possible that it kill areas of the brain with ECT. Does it, do, is there evidence that it might destroy anything? No, but it, it, but it's a seizure, right? So, so well, it's the, the, one of the, the, the side effects is memory loss. Um, and that's, that's for, for the issues. The reason why, like, people are looking for like alternatives to ECT that work as well as ECT is because ECT is quite extreme, like physically extreme, and it has a few side effects that are not um, ideal, including memory loss, and including the fact that you know you have to have anesthetic and you're inducing seizures, and yeah, it's a, just an extreme brain event. So it's 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 like a you know last resort kind of treatment um or at least you know you have to show cause um and uh yeah but but again like it, it's it because of because of all the things that john just said it, it's very hard to get approval to do this on on you know healthy controls and um which would be really interesting, right? Yeah. <laughs> in, in terms of um, what what would that do? <laughs> right? Sounds like a university would have a problem getting that approved. Well, it, you know, it, it's it's um, yeah, but it but it makes it hard to understand what some of these you know what some of these uh, treatments do, right? You know, I mean. Adam Ghazali had had the hardest time getting approval to to give healthy you know healthy young adults uh, um, uh, an MCI um, drug and um, um, yeah trying to create control groups in these studies is yeah it's it's not easy because you're trying to study the possible detriments of a system that you know works but it's so extreme that you want to make sure there aren't side effects you are unaware of because of the people you're using it on already exhibit certain things that you can't directly attribute to the device which 
Well, yeah. I, I, but, it, you know, in in this case, it would be, it, it, or at least in, in Adam's case, it was kind of like, well, I'm, I'm essentially asking for permission to test a, a nootropic, you know, um, and like why, you know, they'll, they'll be supervised. <laughs> if, if anything, we're just bringing it into the lab. What, what a lot of people in Silicon Valley are already doing. So like, why don't we uh, image their brains while they're, while they're doing this? Um, yeah. Uh, I'd, I'd love to, I, you know, there's a new director at the TMS, uh, TMS Center in Stanford. I think she's on the, I think she's the, she might, she's either first or last author on the, the Saint study uh, report. And I, I'd love to have, have her or somebody, um, somebody in her group talk about that, that work and, you know, learn more about what they, what they're still trying to to understand about the the effectiveness and and mechanism, right? Um, and anyway, if anybody, if you know anybody who'd love to to talk about that, hello. So, um, yeah, thanks thanks, Abby, for bringing up the the question. Um, if anybody. Anybody's new would like to introduce themselves. Um, there's there is no pressure, but uh, you're very welcome. Uh, certainly, always looking for more more questions or topics that um, people would like to. See discussed. Uh, uh, I think something that was interesting with the, the discussion right before tonight's meeting started a bit about like EG and um, movement um, mm -hmm. with um, situations where you can start to just see how people feel when they're either seeing certain things or doing certain activities. And at some point, if there's a way to figure out if there are larger scale, like, location effects, um, like, there's always been kind of an idea in, like, city planning where certain areas of a city make people feel a certain way, but that is actually kind of hard to psychologically prove that, like, people feel depressed in certain parts of a city or see people, like, see why or what happens if you can kind of study how people feel in different situations or if there's enough repetition of certain situations in a certain location that that situ the feeling from those situations gets associated with that location. I like, like, like where you lay your head at night is special. Like, let's say you have two rooms, one where you've slept for, you know, let's say five years. But then they replicate the whole room down to the every every little detail, and it's just in another part of the city that you're like indifferent towards. But it's not going to be home for you, and I'm sure that would register eventually. Yeah, <laughs> it has to exist. <laughs> yeah, there's there's just a lot of things that like there's been like lightweight just bulk studies done on like people's like happiness perception studies of like cities, states, and even countries. Like, what's the happiest country on earth? There's, <laughs> depending on the metric, it's either Costa Rica or someplace in Scandinavia. Those are like 
the two areas that always are considered the happiest. Um, and that's all just from people filling out forms, but there's no psychological data that can show why are those happiest places other than the um, questions that they ask. Is there some, is there other stuff that affects that? Um, my, my daughter has something that I need to see right now. Just one second. Do it. Check, check, yeah. the, uh, check the link in the... Uh, Sounds extremely important. important. In the chat, um, there is... Uh, I love any paper that's got a phantom head. And, <laughs> uh, and this is... That sounds like a, um, a good that example. That's exactly of, uh, what we were talking about. My goodness. Oh. Yeah. As I say, that sounds like a good example. Like trying to ask questions about city location or geographic location and brain responses. Like that sounds like a, an open humans type um, yeah. project. Uh, unless you need to be getting data from somewhere. Yeah, like if if we could have someone walk around wearing a muse for a long enough time that they um, were able to like get rid of the noise that the movement itself causes. And, but also we'd probably want either some form of internal slash external eye tracking so we know what they're visually focused on um, as well, because just having, excuse me, um, location data wouldn't always say all that much because, like, you know, you can almost fake it with VR. Oh yeah, true. You true. Just get a three sixty camera, and then you do that, and then you probably need to look at the difference between. What's it like when we put somebody in VR and they're in the place versus being in the real place? I think that'd be the yeah. the real kicker. Yeah. The, the Has anybody one... done anything like that, John? So I I haven't seen any studies, but like I've done tests of that um, at NoiseBridge in Google Earth VR where. I'd have people go to places they visited long ago in the past, like 10, 20 years. And they were able to very quickly remember memories they had forgotten about that location. Just by visiting in VR. Um, and that was very cool. It was just very simple, but I, I've had enough people have the same exact response to visiting places in VR that it brings back memories. I really wanted to try doing it with some older people who traveled further or want to visit some place that's completely changed in the time since they gone. Yeah. Um, but psychologically, I think one problem is that the, I don't know if psychologically this does anything, but most of the movement mechanism for visiting places in VR, because you're standing or sitting still, there's instantaneous vertigo, which only a few games have actually properly addressed. Um, most use a non-traditional form of locomotion called like teleport or blink, where it fades you out then fades you in at this new location. It's not smooth motion. Once you get used to VR, you can do smooth motion and not get vertigo. Like I can sit in this chair, spin around 
while in VR and not get too sick. <laughs> um, interesting. But um, that's where in the future things like properly built VR treadmills and stuff could be very helpful where you are actually physically moving in real space even though you're standing still because the treadmill's moving under you. Um, that could really help. I don't remember what university built it, but they were the first place I saw actually build a big enough um, omnidirectional treadmill to actually allow a person to like run at full speed and jump and do things that in most of these systems is not able to easily be done. Um, but yeah, it would be really cool to see what, um, yeah, I think VR would definitely probably be the easiest starting point for doing tests like that. Because you um, can do the eye tracking. Yeah. Um, That's what I was hinting at, because uh, the eye tracking rig for uh, a park is a little more complicated than just yeah. having the VR with the headset. Uh, yeah. John, is John or Morgan, can y'all speak to like what part of the brain that we know so far handles what we know about where we are in the world? Not just up and down and things like that. I know that's mostly like in the in ear. Yeah, uh, like, um, like how we know we're in the park, even if we close our eyes. Well, the the obvious answer to that is hippocampus, um, but exactly how that kind of, I mean, okay, we know a lot about how the how neurons fire in the hippocampus of mice when they're moving through cages, moving through mazes, and um, as someone, so some people, some people actually make the argument, um, which is a reasonable one, that we know we know more about that, and we kind of learned more about um, the kind of principles of spatial navigation and the neural systems underlying that than we do about the visual system, which has been like a module, a model system for since the fifties or whatever, and but spatial navigation has been a model system since about the eighties. Um, so you know, <clears throat> basically. Um, for f in mice, we know that uh, you have essentially um, cells in the hippocampus that are kind of laid out in a um, what do you say? Uh, they have an allocentric representation of space, and they essentially they 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 kind of fire when they have bits cells that are specifically coding specific locations in space. So they, they kind of, you, you move through that location in space in the cell fires. Um, and those map there are like multiple maps like that that are overlaid on each other that represent different like local and larger parts of the environment. Um, and there's definitely been imaging studies on this in humans and people have done stuff like, you know, get people to do VR na navigation stuff in a scanner and studied hippocampus and I think maybe parietal lobe, maybe people look at that for navigation, but mm. I'm not really an expert on that um, beyond knowing that what we do know well, we know it in mice. Um, and that got the Nobel Prize, actually, it's worth noting, <laughs> two years ago. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting. I'm thinking like a good other test of Something like that is like, I know me personally, I have a very accurate 3D, um, like location based memory yes. such that I can, if there were no cars and bumpers on the road, I could drive around most of San Francisco fully blindfolded. Like I, when someone else is driving me, I can close my eyes and still give them turn for turn directions just based on the acceleration and having 
a starting point and an end point. Um, uh, based on like how either I remember either the street's grades or how a street curves, stuff like that, where it's just all about like the acceleration of it. But it, but I can't really explain it fully, but, but yeah, I think trying to figure out what our mind is like doing to either pull from memory that we're at a certain location or using like a single slice of visual information to then substantiate what our location like what what part of the experience happens first to make us know we're at a location would it require it to be visual or could it be some other aspect um if yeah i mean a lot of well very in, good in, the, in the mice it's it's um it's definitely not visual and it's if anything it has to do with eyes. the locomotion yeah. it's like I, th I think i might be wrong about this actually but i yeah i, I definitely i'm i'm pretty sure that the 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 mouse knows where it is in space on the basis of information that's more than just visual information and part of it is to do with information about knowing where it's moved from yeah. you know motor actions yeah and we're, we're all just glorified mice you know so, so that probably generalizes <laughs> But uh, you taught me some new words, allocentric, and I, I've just dropped a link in the chat uh, for allocentric and versus egocentric spatial process. And yeah, it's a big combination of that. That makes sense with what you just uh, said, John. So. Yeah, I feel, I feel like I didn't do a great job of, um, uh, you know, describing the amazing work that led to the Nobel Prize for for the Moses and O'Keefe. Here's like, what I understand. Guys we could really do like visual, you could do if your eyes are closed and you kind of like hear, ah, I heard I know that that sound comes from such and such building. And then other than that, it's really you just know your internal accelerometer that I've gone forward or backwards. Or yeah, that that that's a good analogy, internal internal accelerometer. Um, yeah. and it may actually involve um, things like the inner ear um, yeah. in kind of computing those things. So, like, what would happen if you tried to do this same exploration in VR with your eyes closed while in VR? <laughs> because you'd be, like, traveling through space, um without any visual representation and no like um internal accelerometer either so you could visualize you something get from point a to point b driving a virtual car with your eyes closed what? without the acceleration part i think that would be an interesting way to see if is there more to it than just visual or internal like memory um i think you're going to play a trick on the brain when you do that <laughs> Cer certainly it, it's not it's not directly you know it's not uh, addressing your question but but i i do love all the uh all the studies that do use doom uh as just a a level um you know, a level generator for some sort of map, and and like they're testing your ability to to you know map this out uh, uh, in your heads, and yeah, more there should be more doom studies, you know, more more, <laughs> more studies that use Quake. 
Um, and uh, anyway, that's that's what we should be. We should be really getting our game server working uh, um, because we've got the EEG that we can connect to it. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah. Uh, and certainly one of the one of the brain hack uh, uh, you know proposals projects was was of course hyperscanning um, which we could be doing too like not just you know not just where are you in the map that you've learned by walking around the map but where are the other people <laughs> like uh, or where do you think the other people are <laughs> yeah. yeah um anyway Lots of good behavioral stuff that uh, it could be tracking, and my my apologies to um, hopefully um, I see that a couple of people actually asked um, for the password about an an hour ago. Um, is um, anybody anybody new here who'd uh, like to introduce themselves? I posted the password on the Slack. Is that okay? Yes, yes, definitely on the Slack. I, I just prefer not, you know, on the comments and the meetup. Yeah. Uh, uh, but yeah, Slack, Slack. Uh, did did somebody ask on Slack? Uh, I did, and then oh, Ryan okay. sent it to me. So I assume other people like me are looking at the Hack Night channel. Gotcha, gotcha. This yeah. is the Hack Night thing. Yep. So I thought yep. it should be there. Yeah, and. Um, um, so I, I have a question. So I got the uh, I got the Muse, and so far all I have seen with it is the app that it has for the uh, the phone. But you mentioned that it's compatible with uh, notebooks or some other uh, like BCI tools. Like yes. Uh, so so what I how do I do that? Yeah. You you I take it though that you're using your. Um, Maybe your laptop Bluetooth. I mean, right now it's it's talking to the app on my phone. But I could pair it with my laptop if okay. I have drivers. So, so drive, should I download laptop drivers for it? The so um, there's two two things to do. One is there's a, there's an app called Mind Monitor, which is really good that you have to okay. pay for, but it's worth. Uh, it's it's probably worth it. It's about fifteen bucks or something. Um, and that can. How they use it, like, make recordings and, um, and like export them. So great. And put that uh, on LSL. That's... It can stream on um, OSC, but I'm not sure if it can talk if that if that app can talk directly to LSL. But yeah, is, um, there, is there a good way to get the views into LSL? Because I, I wanted to start with an LSL yes. for Unity integration. For sure. Um, so what operating system are you on? On Windows. You're on Windows. Right. Yeah. So you want to use a, a program called Blue Muse. OK. Um, I'll put the link in the app. Thank you. In the chat. Then that's, that's like a third party app um, program that will initiate an LSL stream. And then if you're, and then there's a there's a Python library called Muse LSL that will pull that. But if you're if you're kind of working with LSL, then maybe maybe you just need the stream and then you can go from there. Okay, I'm getting the Windows Blue Muse app. And I'm just dropping in another link. Um, this is more to follow up on the the depression EG thread. Um, so it, it's it's it has some of the um, explanations of some of the acronyms that John was talking about. Um, and I'm kind of curious about the uh, this vigil algorithm, but getting getting at uh, something something more than just looking at the resting EEG. Um, 
or at least some some other metric that they're drawing from that about arousal. I'd be be interested. Um, Alex, I do still have a I do have a dongle and and headset for you. Um, I don't know if if John does he not need this anymore. Is that a plug-in for the USB port on it to connect it to the computer or something? Yeah, I mean, so on Windows, does is it only on Mac and Linux that I need this uh, Blue Giga adapter? That's right. Oh, okay. Yeah, and, um, for okay. Windows, uh, Muse does this right. Great. Yeah, I should be good now. I I, I also added some sets of instructions for Windows. There are a few things that are slightly out of date in. Uh, I can't remember exactly which ones. Great. Actually, there isn't much. I'm just flashing through the instruct. Actually, yeah, the win the Windows instructions thing is pretty, pretty correct. Um, awesome, John. All all paid. So between. Two. Are you are you known as John on Slack? John Griff. I'm on Slack. Yeah. So I'm going to ping you on there just so if I need to follow up, I know who you are. Yeah. Go ahead. No worries. Great. Um, so, hey, Josh, um, is, is Josh on right now? So I, I might have... Put him on the spot. Um, yeah, my, my, yeah, my phone is just slow. no. No worries. Um, hey, I I see that uh, Dimitri's on too, and I was wondering if you wanted to to talk about some of the um, electrode choices, or you know, some some of the things that you were sharing with me earlier today. Um, is he on? Oh, I don't see Dimitri here. Oh, wait, no, no, there is. Okay. Uh, well, yeah, I don't know. I was just, I mean, I'm, I'm hardly, hardly the expert on this, but I was just looking through all the different options and there's all kinds of, uh, pretty much all the materials you'd want to use for electrodes for like, <laughs> not like silver chloride, but like subpar gold or, uh, yeah, it's pretty much gold and copper. Um, there's all kinds of cheap stuff out there. So we're looking at pogo pins or, uh, I don't know, like, there's there's all kinds of conductive cloths or conductive foams that are standard. So, uh, so just just give the give stuff those on the Muse. Like, I found it on like Amazon, <laughs> or at least something that looks like it. It's probably not the same stuff. I don't know. Sure, just just to give people some context. Um, um, so you know, Josh has has uh, gotten the Dimitri's free EG thirty two board, um, kind of. Uh, prepared for a um, crowdsourced uh, uh, crowd supply. Um, I don't know if you call it project, um, but uh, well, it's, it's starter. It's just a crowd supply yeah. site. It's typically for open hardware. Yeah, yeah, and you know, it's it's what you use for Hedgeduino. It's what uh, Gene's used for for Spectra, um, and. Um, so it sounds like it sounds like you've got some dates. Um, that so yeah, we're targeting mid July. Um, I think July sixteenth is the tentative date. And, uh, so so this is um, yeah, you know, mid mid July to kind of like end of August. Um, yeah, it'll probably be a five or six week uh, period, and then right. yeah. And so and uh, again, this is you know a a thirty two channel board. That um, uh, has some some you know really sweet chipset uh, included and uh, a lot of other features that um, make it yeah you know uh, um, a really attractive board um, right and and they're just you know it it was just a, an electronics project though. And so now um, what Josh is, is, you know, trying to, I think, trying to get some, some feedback on is the additional, you know, kind of the details in terms of 
um, you know, uh, people are going to want uh, electrodes to go with this. <laughs> um, and, you know, even even things like the connectors aren't fully set yet. Right, Josh? Um, you mean like for electrodes? Well, just no, actually like uh, how how you attach the leads to the board. So oh right. Well, there's there's water. just um, breakout pins, and then like there's a lot of I don't know, a lot of uh, electrodes come with like the, at least like the pre-made electrodes come with nice hookups for like for using that stuff out of the box basically. Yeah, I I, <laughs> I was looking at AliExpress, and you know they've got all the all this stuff. And, um, it's pretty much all set up basically to to work with the breakout board, but. Um, yeah. I don't, you know, we're looking into custom, but I doubt we'll get anything, <laughs> anything ready by mid July. Um, and then, uh, so I don't know, we're just looking into our options. And, um, yeah. Um, so I, I'm just going to post a link to, um, to Hackaday uh, U or University. Um, so Hackaday is, um, is rolling out some, you know, it, it's been doing this, I don't want to say informally, but not not as, um, uh, I guess, more like a soft launch um, in terms of their KiCad and FreeCAD uh, classes. Um, and the kinds of, you know, kinds of, of skill sets that be really, really important for, um, you know, understanding. Um, so, you know, Dimitri's, all the materials that Dimitri makes available and trying to do things with them, um, especially to add, add to them. Um, and let me just, so I know that, um, I know that Bernard, the boards that the Bernard first got that he's he's going to put on his own connectors um, for those. Um, let me just. Uh, I've got. Sorry, I had another another bomb of. Um, Bill materials for to share, which now I can't quite find in all my open tabs. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so I, I don't know if you if you can post any of the links, but um, you know some of the. Um, these, um, are, they, are they referred to as pogo electrodes? Pogo pins? Pogo pins. They're just alloyed, right? Um, and then they're really standard for, uh, for like probes. Um, so like one of the probes we found, like they had, they're spring loaded, waterproof, uh, they had rounded edges. So like that was pretty nice. Um, and, uh, of course, you know it's. I have no idea how well they'd work. Dimitri said he's he's tried these before, and you know with gel, of course, they they seem to work. Um, Are you able to send a like link to the types of pins you're talking about? Like, don't know how many people here have actually used pogo pins for electronics or. Um, well, neurotech if, stuff. If you just if you just Google pogo pin, like the first images that come up are like pretty much the exact kind of things I'm talking about. Um, yeah. Hold on. There's all kinds yeah. of different ones as well. Um, they're just spring loaded pins, so they retract when you when you poke them. Yeah. The the. You know, I mean, with the with the crowd supply, will there be um, will there be a cap, or will you just be it'll be just selling the board? Yeah. Well, again, we're looking into it. We're 
I mean, and we're, we're going to do as much as we can. Sure, um, sure. If anything, we'll probably, you know, depending on time frame, we'll probably just find um, some reliable, affordable electrodes and just sell those at cost, um, just so that people have access to something to go with the boards. Um, and then, you know, maybe maybe Bernard might have something ready by then if if he wants to. But I mean, his that. his would be his would be awesome. Right. It's, yeah, that's the flex boards. Um, I mean, you know, that's the that's the closest thing to, you know, a net, um, which is I still think is. I mean, especially if you're going to go, um, you know, high density, like you want. Right. Um, so brain Pro brain brain products is is now selling a. a Forgive me for calling it an EGI style net, but I don't know what else to call it. <laughs> um, I don't know if legally they're allowed to say that. Um, but I, I Um, so he doesn't have a website yet, does he? Who? Um, Bernard. Oh, I asked Dimitri. Dimitri, I, I haven't actually talked to Bernard in a while. Um, let me see the last message I got from him. Uh, uh, he told last time that he traveling somewhere. Oh, okay. When we when he will arrive uh, to his office, then uh, he will test uh, the, his boards, which he got from uh, Seed Studio. Gotcha. Yeah, I mean, I I see I see they arrived <laughs> message from him uh, June June third, um, so that's that's cool, and and I still I'd love to know what the what the pricing is for. For brain products net, um, but I, I I know that Bernard was was um, trying to deal with the um, kind of like the the cabling issues and you know the cabling management that would come with uh, sixty four electrodes, which is still you know given I mean he's still hand. I don't want to say sewing those. Uh, it, it's a different design than than uh, EGI's nets, but um, you know, with lots of three D printed parts, um, but it it still retains the kind of the flexibility of the of the net in terms of adapting to the the person's head shape and and also keeping keeping the electrodes uh, fixed, um, you know, in, in place. Because if not, then, you know, again, it's like with 32 channels, you're going to be using a cap or something. And um, uh, yeah, so you're either going to get into, you know, I mean, you can get you can get contact with those uh, pogo pins, but um, they're they're. They're not a robust alternative. Um, uh, and of course, I'm, I'm still really interested in, in ganging, uh, you know, four of these, these boards together and seeing what kind of price point you can, you can make a, a 128 amp. We uh, I can talk to uh, DLM if you want. It's we, I finally got scaling figured out at least for up to hundred and it's pretty great. Yeah, 
That's, I mean, for, it's... For just four of them, uh, let's see, where did I put my... I did the math, and uh, for just four of them, I got it down to 162 a pop. Then for 20, it goes down to 140. For 50, it goes down to 115. Yeah. For 100, it goes down to 103 a pop. And then from there, it drops below 100. And that's for these four channel boards with, um, they've got these uh, ARM, what, A7 or M7 boards on them. So they're really pretty sweet. Maybe they do play. And and some some of these issues really don't come up unless you you know until you actually try and build a, a 128 system, but you know the way that um, the way that Biosemi you know sort of scales quote scales their their leads is you know they just they have multiple ribbon cables that that you know still have to eventually break out um, and and. You know, hit some section of of the, of the head, um, and I really think once once you once you're like targeting 128 or 256, like you want you want something like uh, like these nets, um, and you know at that price point, like I've I I put you in touch with Andre um, Andre Schmackoff just about the hypertronics connector. I mean, I think those are kind of expensive, but you know, that just it's like a couple hundred bucks. If it simplifies the the cabling and the and the the lead management, I think it's like absolutely worth it. But this is this is at the high end. This is like when you're trying to do high density. Hmm. Um, he, he pointed you to some spec sheets, or no? Right. Well, I remember looking at the EGI stuff. I, for, I forgot the rest. <laughs> um, sorry, I know that was on. That was on Hangout. But uh, I've been out picking morels for a week, so I'm a little discombobulated. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, I'm the one who keeps pushing on the. Um, yeah, I, you got some great pictures of mushrooms there. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, there's they're everywhere. It's incredible. It's like buckets and buckets. Um. Okay, now I think we just talked about the EGI net, and then we got into talking about other stuff. Oh okay, yeah. He, so yeah, he's he's just saying my estimate of bomb is is four hundred dollars for the parts, right? For the for the parts. Um. Yep. Yep. That's all right. And then, uh, but then with production costs, it's, it still ends up being about at least with PCB way, it ends up being about one hundred sixty bucks a board, just for four. Scaling is awesome, though. I mean, you know, we're, if these things take off, I mean, we're talking about $100, 32-channel boards. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have a dumb question. Well, tell me if this is a dumb question. Um, so I, I haven't, well, um, my first encounter with a, an open BCI ultra cortex was, uh, when this one turned up from Jaden in the post, um, why do they use, why do they have this 3d printed system? Like why is, is it just, are like, uh, caps not economic or something? It just seems like a weird way to do it versus a cap. So I agree a little bit, but after looking at alternatives, I think it's because it's, or at least what I can find the cheapest method for applying dry electrodes, because um, I just bought, let me see if I can grab it real quick.
I just bought a bunch of electrodes and this 19 channel headband type device mm. from Florida Research Instruments. And this thing is a pain in the ass. I almost don't even I almost don't even want to use it because it takes such a long time to get this thing strapped to my head, put on properly, then stick these tiny like little electrodes in there yeah. and snap the cables on there. It takes a long time. So and I initially got it because I was take it took such a long time for me to get the ultra cortex on and then like get all the electrodes lined up properly to get a good signal with it being like repeatable and easy to slap back on between uses. Uh, and I thought, okay, maybe a cap or something like this would be easier and I was dead wrong. That helped. Oh, y'all are talking about the headband kit? Yeah, mine was from uh, Florida Research Instruments. Did you get it directly from them or through uh, the OpenBCI store? Directly from them because you guys only offer the uh, single headband and they have the, have the 19 channel one. Oh, I can't see it. It's like, uh, it's like even difficult to put on or like mess with because oh, wow. of all the Velcro and stuff. But like, but that's supposed to be like the cheapest, the cheapest options. If you don't know the hat, it's hard to do ten twenty on yourself. Is it even possible? I don't know. This is why I went with the, it's like, the ultra cortex. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. I've done the seat single one, and I tried it, and it's okay. the mo The main drawback to that is sometimes if you really are chasing good impedance, uh, you might want to put it too hard against the uh, the head. And thinking about doing studies, that's one of the risks of doing crowdsourced EEG studies is people might scratch their head with the electrodes, the dry electrodes. Um, I scratch it. my head all the time with the dry <laughs> electrodes. Um, every, every time I wear the, uh, or at least until I replace them with the rounded combs, when it came with the electrodes that the Open BCI comes with, every time I'd wear it, I would take it off and then just have the imprints of dots all along my skin. Yeah, but I mean, is that oh, have yeah. you always been uh, clean shaven? <laughs> yeah. I mean, but you flat electrodes are just best for you all around. I guess. Yeah, and that's why I got these ones, and and they're plated yeah. too instead of uh, coated. There was another uh, guy that uh, started working with Open BCI and uh, I was like, you know what? You don't have much hair. The cap might work really well. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're expensive. <laughs> uh, the, there's some guy that keeps... He, it's a pretty lively thread on the Open BCI forums and he did the Green Tech cap, I believe. Hmm. He I'll did, he did the Green Tech cap with a sight on. I'll have to take a look into that. Because I like the, um, I was getting great impedance when I was testing these electrodes. I was only getting like down to, I think, 70 kilo ohms. And uh, across like the whole scalp, it was just the repeatability of it was what was a pain in the ass. Can we talk about what's good impedance for a second? Yeah. I'm we can. Kind of feeling like anything under a thousand seems good based on what I've seen in the GUI. But uh, <laughs> with it. hair, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I've got pretty thick hair too. Yeah, I believe the, if I remember correctly from the conversation I had with William in the forum, uh, and like he linked me to a few other previous discussions, it's for the front electrodes on your scalp, um, optimal range is about 300, and then for anywhere with hair, it's about like 900 to I think 1200 is the optimal range, or might have been 700 to 900. Hey Morgan, what's it yeah. like uh, for impedance for high density systems and other thing other things besides just well, the consumer grade. So so certainly I mean back back in my day, uh, um, you know, it was like five kilo ohms or less. And that that was um, what a clinical EEG system would would, you know, require. And but but there was, you know, Anyway, we would say 50 kilo ohms or less. But the main thing is that the what you actually want is is your impedances to be the same across channels, so that the front end of the amplifier is doing its job, 
and and you know uh, um, catching you know catching the noise that's coming in on those on all those channels. Um, um, so I guess it's referenced when we do it with OpenBCI with the standard setup. The impedance is referenced against the earlobes. I think hey, are, are, are you doing what? Impedance check. But no, I mean, sorry, linked to earlobes. Yeah, that's how I have it. Yeah, they got the two uh, the earlobe electrodes connected. To bias and ref, maybe. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I could grab my board and check. So that 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 makes it that makes it um, that makes it such that you can't then re-reference after um, if if you're using if you're linking. Two references, because you don't you don't know the. Where's the reference on the mute? It, it right in this. It, it, you know, usually you want you want to have a midline reference. Uh, um, so you know, on EGI system, it's it's vertex. Um, I've used you know I've used systems where we we'll put it on the nose. <laughs> Where, where people were still trying to get like a like a you know noise free reference, um, uh, but but definitely you know having something midline. Um, I mean, I, I think the the linked was trying to you know make sure you didn't have an asymmetry, but uh, the problem is then you can't re reference because you don't know the individual contribution. Um, Um, this is a little bit of a tangent, but has anyone moved the emotive M N eight? Can you say that one more time? Has anyone worked with the emotive M N eight? No. It's like their new. Is that the headphone? Yeah. No, I'd like to hear that, about it. That's the thing they said they Me were. Are they available now? I believe so. I was on their website today and found them, and I couldn't find any research on them. But I think you talked about it at the. I'm very intrigued. What I'm forgetting already, the narrow the BCI 101 conference. I thought he brought it up. Who who would that have been? Uh, it's whoever talked from Emotive. Oh. I think he said they were using it in the workplaces to test. Uh, they definitely have they definitely have some some studies like that but um i see that the x epic x it seems like they're only offering the m and for partnerships right now ah uh, okay because in, on their website for all their other products it says x. what was that If anybody wants to, I'm pretty sure if, if you find the recording of the BCI 101 talk, uh, I think I'm pretty sure you mentioned it. That looks like a really cool use. I, I'd love to get something like that, though, also considering that's only like four electrons roads and they're right behind the ear and wondering like what they're going for data wise um because yeah like the idea makes a lot of sense it's something that people can wear for a long time even while being active um they yeah makes a lot of sense but uh, 
There was, yeah. a, there was a company, um, there was a company in Montreal. I forget what the name of the technical university there. It's like ET something. Um, ETS. Yeah, ETS. Yeah. Uh, um, so um, I know I there was like a, a workshop or a meeting at McGill, and um, and the guy was. Um, you know, founder was had some, you know, EEG ear uh, electrodes. Um, I I'm blanking on his um, um. It was definitely a spinoff from ETS, <laughs> and and um. I, I, the reason I'm saying that is that I'm just wondering if there's an open hardware version that's pretty close to that because uh, as as I understand it the the it's hard to work with motive without um, without using their SDK but I'm I'm very happy to be corrected on that um, Um, there's a couple similar consumer products I was able to find. I think there's four or five that are trying to do the same thing and seem like they have similar technology. Um, so hopefully, even if Motives is hard to work with, we'll be able to get a couple. Um, I actually have to run, but it was great talking to you. Hey, it, it, so you guys, if, if you've got a if you've got a link, please share it. Um, yeah, those those EG ear. Systems are are kind of cool, but Do I you still want a link for the M and eight. I already put my name. M and eight oh. alternatives, yeah. Okay. Oh, I didn't put any of the alternatives. In. But I I still I still love that um, that uh, C C strip of electrodes that you just pay you know um um you remember those John um. I, yeah, I'm blanking I on the, the company. I can't remember name. the name. <laughs> I don't know what you're yeah, it's um, I, I, it's um, Stefan Debner's, or you know, I don't, I don't know whether he's technically. I think he's like a scientific advisor for them. Anyway, what we need to do is get. This this kind of information uh, um, update the learn dot uh, edu and you know so when it says like what systems purchase like there would be you know the the four ear EEG systems plus the you know the headbands plus the you know the kind of like emotive cognomics um, uh, uh, kind of I don't know what what we want to call those those systems that are um not, I, not I think something that would be great to test with headphones like that um is how well um current spatial audio technology is um and how good current hrtfs um uh, are for sound just like try to have some, some sort of cognitive um back measurement to how much a person whether they can hear the difference or not their brain can like sense that there's some sort of difference so do a study where you have like a room where you have sounds come from a specific spot then uh, put it yes. in the <laughs> headphone. Keep going. Like, uh, there's a technology actually where you can have an array of speakers. And I watched a demonstration from a guy from Florida at a concert at LSU. And basically, you can use that array to make a sound move forward and backwards. And oh, yeah. You'd be surprised. And that, that was part of the demonstration. But the room itself had like 96 speakers in it. Yeah. You can, 
you can basically recreate, if you have a 360 microphone, you can recreate all of that. And even putting it down to two, uh, yeah. two channels, it's a lot, man. But you kind of miss in the like, if something moves forward and backwards, um, this but is if, how we if, if you have proper HRTFs, you, you, the max you need with a proper spatialized audio headset, which I tried the one that ever got produced. The uh, um, uh, what's the acronym? H R. Uh, uh, so it, um, HRTF um, head related transfer function, um, but. Um, HRTF sits pretty much a map of the ear, and then you use an algorithm to figure out how real world sounds bounce off your ear. Oh my and God. if you have a special type of headphone that has maybe two or three speakers in each one, it can recreate any spatial audio source down to like. I don't remember the accuracy, but it's within like a quarter magnitude of what we can actually um, accurately detail, which our hearing naturally is has like a one degree accuracy at like 30 or 40 feet. If the sound is 30, 40 feet away, we can turn to it with that much accuracy and the closer it gets the more accurate it is but um the o6 had the um gaming headphones that they sadly went out of business i got to try it and the it was amazing to actually try properly tuned spatial audio headphones like the headphones How many is it what so is it still two channels left or, or right? I mean, so it's using an outer side. Yeah. So I think each one had two speakers in it. So, um, yeah, you can, that's enough to do like a triangulation thing on each year. Yep. Oh, and, okay. um, but the thing is, is through pulsing the speaker, it would first create a mesh of your ear by using how the sound bounced back. So it had microphones in it as well. Like these yeah, they had the sound off of it and did like a sonar trick you're telling me. Yep, exactly. And so they would That's personalize crazy. that set would learn what your ears look like and then it the audio would move because the headphones had six degree of freedom accelerometers in it. So as you move, if there was a sound here, it would stay there perfectly. And I tried it in VR um, at a GDC a couple years ago before they went out of business. And they gave you orbs of sound that you threw in this room and they bounced off the walls. And I could close my eyes in VR and turn to where the sound was and open my eyes, and it was accurate every time. I saw um, some real crazy okay. things like that at CES one year where yeah. it was there that these they're called like laser speakers. Oh where they yes. beam a sound to like a 3D point, and you can walk around the area and not hear it, but once your ear is directly in that point in 3D space, you hear the sound. And oh, yeah, that's kind of the trick I, was I saw. Wait, how, what was the speaker configuration in that thing you're describing? Uh, like, I don't remember. Yeah, they, it was called a laser was, speaker. So oh. that actually is literally just a laser. So a laser can uh, affect the atmosphere, like the water molecules around your ear enough that those molecules can start to transmit the sound that the um, uh, laser, like I actually know the person who first created the like idea that a laser can be used to directly transmit sound through excitation of other molecules that the laser's moving through. 
Um, and like he's shown me a demo a while back where he literally could turn a solar panel into a powerful enough amplifier that if you pointed a laser with an audio signal at a solar panel, and that solar panel would directly connect it to earphones, it would produce audio. And it, um, but the problem right now is we don't know psychologically how accurate, if we can figure out a true baseline for what real people are hearing versus what they hear in a game or a um, audio situation. Because something that's been discussed a lot in VR and gaming is that about 50% of the experience is audio. Like, video is the main way we directly experience something but in those situations but that the audio is what we cognitively use to move much more often but we don't have a any real good audio cognitive studies that i can find um where like eg during audio listening or stuff like that. Yeah, we need more research on uh, psychoacoustics and stuff like that. Well, I had a, a good, uh, interesting conversation with a guy that used to work for um, Neuro. Um, I don't know if you remember this um, particular like adaptive, uh, adaptive headphone. Um, how was it adaptive? What did it help with? It, it was kind of like modeling your modeling your ear. Here, let me um, let me get there. Um, get the, the link for uh, I thought I had a video. <laughs> yes, here we go. Every time I come to one of these, I fill up a browser full of tabs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Is um, Nerf Nerfon <laughs> or Neuro Loop? Um, so it's like personalized sound. A anyway, it, it was cool though because um, he's he's a electrical engineering researcher in an epilepsy group at uh, University of Melbourne, and um, he's actually really interested in in getting uh, getting something like this going. Uh, in terms of a, a conversation about um, green computer interface, you know, um, ECOG, um, you know, SEEG modeling um, going across. Um, he, he was he was initially just talking about Australia, but anyway, he wanted to ask about about Neurotech X and you know our experience and um, yeah. It, it was, you know, I don't know if I've, I've talked him into the into the fold, so to speak, but um, uh, seems like really great group to be um, to be in contact with. And um, when I started, um, we started talking about some, some research things, and I brought up Dave Liley, and he was like, "Oh yeah, Dave, Dave comes to our group. <laughs> you know, we we talk about uh, epilepsy modeling." And so I, I was, I was actually contrasting, you know, Dave Liley's work with, um, with rather like spoof stuff, and um, yeah, he, he was, he was a very interesting guy. Um, hopefully, hopefully we'll hear more from from them. But it was a cool, it was a cool audio. I mean, I guess they're still around. <laughs> I, I didn't. Uh, I don't follow the audio stuff so much, but Dan, um, is this the is this the laser thing you were talking about? It's the first thing that pops up on Google. Sound laser. Sound laser. <laughs> I think that does what you're saying. Yeah, that looks pretty similar to it. That's crazy. 
Yeah, it was really oh. trippy experiencing in person. Oh, okay. So you aren't talking about the actual sound bias lasers. You're talking about the directional speakers. Yeah, okay. and it was like not only just directional, but like mm -hmm. almost like a sphere of sound where like you yeah. can move around it and not hear it, and then once you're in it, you hear it. Yeah, I, yeah, I've used those because the thing is, is with the proper audio equipment, any speakers can do that. You use, you tell where they are in relation to each other, right. and you're able to get them to cancel out any sound outside a certain space. Like, I think I might have heard the guy that invented that algorithm do it, maybe. It's uh, very similar to the principles behind acoustic um, levitation. Yep. Yeah. So um, the same technology is used by ultra haptics or ultra leap, the combination of um, ultra haptics and leap motion, where you can use it. You can use that technology for um, uh, haptics. I've used a couple of those before where you can feel like pressure on stuff. Like you can press buttons in midair. It is oh, yeah. really cool. Um, Did they the, put it in a glove? Um, no, no, literally it's a plate in front of you. Let me find it. Um, You know, I went to um, I once went to a hackathon and they had a demo, and I, I'm not sure who made it, but basically he had also the same sort of thing. He had basically an array of um, microphones, I mean, um, uh, speakers, and basically um, what it reminded me was um, phased antenna arrays. You know what a phased antenna arrays? Yeah. You basically have a whole face, and I used to work on um, I used to work on the radar site. I was put up in BMU's uh, ballistic missile early warning system that went into uh, Filing Dales, England, and I mean all that. I mean the mathematics of that was worked out way back in the '70s, you know. So yeah. I, I don't think it's that much different whether you're using sound or, or using radar frequencies. Yeah, definitely. And um, and I've seen them on radar sites that are also dome shaped. They're basically looking for you know, objects flying around, but basically have um, a dome out there. And then they have uh, like almost like um, a Buckmeister fillerine yeah. layout of the um, of the uh, radars. And so basically, and actually these are mounted on, on ships. So you're basically doing a you know, full panoramic view of what's around you based on, and you're just having a, a you know, set of radar, radars on, on, a, on a, almost like a soccer ball. Like yeah, that's the, sure. that's, that's the non-official name for it. That's all. Yeah. And so I just shared the two um, systems that UltraLeap, that Explore is the one I know a lot of people who've used, um, but, um, but the Inspire is a lot of fun because it's pretty much, it's, I'd say about half a, about six inches by what 16 inches and that full service anywhere within about a foot in front of it you can place virtual in a sense objects or buttons that you can interact with and it can give pretty high accurate texture in a sense um like it can't do things like wetness or, but it can do things like grit pretty well. It, um, and it can't do temperature yet, but um, theoretically you could put some tiny directional, like heat, hot or cold blowers in front of it. Um, there were some really cool mixed reality projects that have used it at CES um, where people were wearing um, uh, 
HoloLens, not HoloLens, um, Magic Leap glasses, and these were what they were using to interact with this simulated world, and it was really cool. I haven't gotten to try it yet, but it's out of the Bay Area. Um, but yeah, I want to now find the sound laser stuff I was talking about where it uses an actual laser. Sounds to me like we're just, uh, I mean, trying to figure out what people are looking at when you're doing a study for EEG, I think VR is just really going to help. I think it's already headed that direction. Hey, John, have you noticed that? Are you picking on me because I'm not enough? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm sure. I think you're an hour ahead of me. I'm, not, I, I'm pretty, pretty VR naive I'm, I'm sorry to say um i've only kind of played around in um game stores and um i've got some exploring to do on vr but have you seen a more paper i, I would think it's becoming cheaper the tech is because otherwise i thought for doing eye tracking you had to have complicated camera systems instead of just doing eog A little above. I think with eye tracking depends what kind of tracking you want to do, like what level of accuracy you want. Um, you can use webcam for minimal stuff, but if you want uh, fast, like micro saccade reconstructions, then maybe you do need a yeah. a expensive device. There's uh, luckily one company that makes really legitimate eye trackers, a Swedish company called Toby, and yeah. uh, they're really good. And the consumer version is only $200, which is really, really cool. Um, and they just announced a new <clears throat> hardware rev, a fifth version. So they upped the sample rate on the eye tracker from 90 hertz to 133. Don't think it makes a big difference, but hey, more samples. Yeah. Um, so it is it is cool. If it wasn't for Toby right now, there'd be nothing you know, in the sub $1,000 range, but at least there is one option. Well, um... I, I motions. I mean, I, I motions is a company to to follow, just to see all the hardware, uh, uh, you know, options that it supports. I mean, so they're they're really a software company, but um, you can there's um, I think I want to call it say it's called like Smart Eye. Anyway, I think Smart Eye is under a thousand. Um, that's also uh, also a bar. Um, and yeah. Okay. Connect V2 and all it does is I think our eyes open or close. Yeah. Right. I mean, so there is there is definitely a, a you know a benefit to to you know the the high-end eye trackers will do two two forty hertz uh, acquisition, and um, let me just see what the I mean. I think I, I yeah. I found the link to the laser. Um, audio thing I was talking about, I just coded, posted in the chat. It, yeah, it's a, it only recently came out that it, you could use laser to trigger this frequency of stuff because lasers have been used to trigger audio for a long time. And that's pretty cool. But back to eye tracking. <laughs> I remember trying a new, more open source eye tracking system at GDC last year. I'll see if I can find it. Um, 
it l looked like it could be pretty useful. Um, but I remember they didn't have a website for a while. I'll try to find that as well. Okay, well, I'm gonna, um, let me just uh, go through usual usual wrap up. Um, this does not mean that um, the conversation needs to end, uh, but I need to, um, promises as usual have been made about ice cream and um, I might actually need to go to the store and get some. <laughs> um, so I uh, just wanna thank everybody for joining us this evening. Um, as always, I wanna thank our videographers, Ryan and Alex. And um, and I know Alex worked uh, hard this week to get uh, our the the most recent um, most recent Hack Night videos, uh, I believe, online. Yeah, so I think they're all on YouTube. I just haven't seen it. Well, uh, yeah, yeah, I got that. Yep. Sorry, I was fumbling with the mute. Um, <laughs> yes, they are <laughs> online and visible. Everything up and, till this week's, which hasn't been posted yet. But yeah, they're all there. And visible. Awesome. So um, yeah, thanks again. And um, I did. Um, has Has anybody actually seen if? It, it, watched the open source ultrasound uh has anybody seen luke jean vu no so i i i didn't spend a lot of time but uh i i didn't actually see it and um anyway i'm gonna check in with roman and see if if we've got all the um all the paris videos that um, that we could have um, but uh, some of, some of them have been uploaded, but they're not actually public. Like, um, like Ryan was just talking about, um, yes. So, and we, you know, um, Kaglar, um, was too busy this week to, to meet on Monday. Um, but, um, he's, Kaglar is still coming to talk Neuralib. And uh, actually, what he wants to do is um, he'd like to do a, a practical. So uh, I don't know whether it'll be like a like a mini workshop, but um, but he's definitely wants to do um, uh, maybe like uh, while while just you know after describing it, uh, he would show us some some things on collab or something like that. Um, anyway, for, yeah, should be, should be great. Um, and yeah, the, um, and did I put in the link? So the open science, open science, uh, special interest group registration is free. Oh, I didn't put the link. And, um, just so you know, the open science SIG is, running from the 22nd to I think July 3rd. And I'm totally, totally blanking on the, uh, on the link here. Uh, sorry, I'm trying to find the registration link, but it's it's free. Um, there's, you know, it, it's um, it's not exactly like the hackathon continued, but um, but lots of open science projects will be, uh, you know, discussed and and presented. I had the, uh, yeah, here it is. Okay. So, and again, it's, um, it's free. 
Um, so that that will be running until until July, and then um, let's. I'm trying to think what else we've got coming up, but yeah, if you're interested in presenting something, um, please please let me know, and yeah, see you see you next week, and that's.